Hey y'all, how you doing today? So, I just had a uh, <clears throat> fun encounter at a store. So, the uh, bill for the store was $5.30. And I reached into my wallet, grabbed a 10, and then reached to hand a one, but she had typed in the 10 first. So she was gonna hand me $4.70 back and change. So I handed her the one and I said, why don't you just grab a five instead of the four and then hand me $5 and 30 or 70 cents. That way it's easier on my wallet. I'm not carrying around all these ones. She looks at me and she goes, I'm sorry but that would make my till count wrong. I can't do that. And I went, um, well, wait a minute. You owe me $4.70, $4.70. So if I hand you a dollar, that makes it $5.70. How's that change your till? And she looks at me again and she goes, I'm sorry, sir, I've already typed it in. I can't give you $5.70. I can only give you $4.70. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I guess I'll just take it, is what I finally said. But I couldn't make her see that if you have $4.70 in one hand, add a dollar to it, it's $5.70, and you didn't take anything more out of this hand. But, I mean, I regress, I, I guess. <laughs> I guess some people, that's they just can't uh, count that much because they didn't see the numbers in front of them or something like that. But it's it's just kind of ridiculous how you can't do that, that, that math inside your head. You can't even do the math to say $5.30, we're going to get a 10, that's $4.70 back. Or I've even had where I've handed someone, we'll use the same $5.30 example, I've gone to McDonald's, bought something, handed that, we'll, we'll say it was $5.30 because I don't remember the actual amount, handed them $11 so that they would just hand me back a five and change, and they handed me back the one and all the other ones. And I was like, but... I gave you 11. And he goes, I know, sir, you gave me too much. So you would give me one bill back instead of five bills or six bills back. <laughs> and it just, it amazes me how counting like that is apparently not taught in schools anymore or, or something, right? Anyway. You guys came for Jim Butcher's Small Favor, book 10 of the Dresden Files. And today what we're on is we're on, looks like chapter 20. Sorry about all the uh, cars driving by. Um, we have so much snow that there's not a lot of places for me to actually park. So anyway, we're on chapter 20. A small favor. So if you guys would go ahead and grab your copies of the book, like, share this, and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And let's go ahead here and jump into chapter 20. This is getting awfully murky, Harry, Michael said, worry in his voice. I don't like it. Snow crunched under our feet as we walked from the house to the workshop. The daylight was fading as a second front hit the city darkening the skies with the promise of more snow. I don't like it much either, I replied. But nobody came rushing up to present me with options. I stopped in the snow. How's Murphy? Michael paused beside me. Charity is the one who's had actual medical training. But it seemed a simple enough injury to me. A bandage stopped the bleeding, and we cleaned the wound thoroughly. She should be careful to monitor her condition for the next few days, but I think she'll be all right. How much pain is she in? I asked. Charity keeps some codeine on hand. 
It isn't as strong as the painkillers at the hospital, but it should let her sleep at least. I grimaced and nodded. I'm going to hunt up the denarians, Michael. He took a deep breath. You're going to attack them? I should, I said a little more sharply than I'd meant to. Because there are people who don't deserve a second chance, Michael. And if these losers don't qualify for that permanent shit list, I don't know who does. Michael gave me a small smile. Everybody does, Harry. A little shiver went through me, but I didn't let it show on my face. I just rolled my eyes. Right, right. Original sin, God's grace. I've heard this part before, I sighed. But I'm not planning to assault them. I just want to learn whatever I can about them before we square off. Michael nodded. Which is why we're standing out in the snow talking, I take it. I needed whatever information you can give me. And, and I don't need another philosophical debate. Michael grunted. I already got in touch with Father Forthill. He sent over a report on who we think might be in town with Tessa. I spent a couple of seconds feeling like an argumentative jerk. Oh, I said. Thank you. That, that, that could help a lot. Michael shrugged. We've learned to be wary of even our own intelligence. The fallen are masters of deception, Harry. Sometimes it takes us centuries to catch one of them lying. No, I said. But you must have something solid. A little, he said. We are fairly certain that Tessa and Imriel are the second eldest of the Denarians. Only Nicodemus and Andreal have been operating longer. I grunted. Are Tessa and Nicodemus rivals? Generally, Michael replied. Though I suppose it bears mention that they're also husband and wife. <laughs> Match made in hell, eh? Not that it seems to mean much to either of them. They very rarely work together, and when they do, it's never good. The last time they did so, according to the church's records, was just before the Black Plague came to Europe. Plagues? The Nickelheads did the last time they, did wor they were in town. I shook my head. You'd expect a different tune or two in a husband and wife act that had been running that long. Variety is the key to a happy marriage, Michael agreed solemnly. His mouth quivered. Nickelheads? I decided their name gave them too much dignity, given what they are. I'm correcting that. Those who underestimate them generally don't survive it, Michael said. Be careful. Eh, you know me. Yes, he said. Where were we? Plagues. Ah, yes. The Nickelheads have used plagues to instigate the most havoc confusion in the past. I fought off a smile that threatened my hard-ass exterior, as Michael continued. It's proven a successful tactic on more than one occasion. Once a plague has gained momentum, there's almost no limit to the lives that can claim and the suffering they can inflict. I frowned and folded my arms. Sonia said that Tessa preferred choosing eager subjects, I suppose over talented ones? Michael nodded. The fallen who follow Imuriel go through barriers very quickly. None of them are kind to those they bond with. But Emeril's crew are the monsters among monsters. Tessa chooses their hosts from among the downtrodden, the desperate, those who believe that they have nothing to lose, those who will succumb to temptation the most rapidly. I grunted. A lot of those around in the wake of a big, nasty plague, or any kind of similar chaos. Yes. We believe that is one reason she collaborates with Nicodemus from time to time. She's focused on short term, I said, getting it. He's all about long term. Exactly, Michael said. When he threw Lashiel's coin at my son, it was a calculated gesture. <laughs> K 
calculated to rope me in, I said. You, Michael said, or my son. A chill that had nothing to do with the air vent threw me. Give the coin to a child? A child who couldn't defend himself, who could be raised with the voice of a fallen angel whispering in his ear, shaping him, preparing him to be used as a weapon against his own family. Imagine it. I stared around the yard that had been the scene of a much merriment only a few hours before. I'd rather not, I said. Michael continued quietly. In general, the families of the bearers of the swords are sheltered against such evils. But things like that have happened before. And Nicodemus has borne a coin for a score of centuries. He has no difficulty with the notion of waiting ten or fifteen or twenty years to attain his goals. That's why you think he's here? I said. Because going after someone like Marcone isn't Tessa's style? It isn't, Michael said. But I believe that if by helping it happen, she could create that kind of environment she loves best, full of chaos and despair. It would be reason enough for her to join forces with her husband. How many? Tessa keeps a group of five other fallen around her. He gave me a quick smile. Sorry, four now. Thank Thomas, I said. Not me. I intend to, Michael said. Nicodemus, Michael shook his head. I believe you've been told before that Nicodemus makes it a point to destroy any records the church manages to build concerning him. That's not going to be easy to arrange in the future. Hail the information age, I interjected. But our accounts regarding him are sketchy. We thought he had only three regular companions. But then he produced Lachiel's coin, which had supposedly been in secure storage in the Chilean monastery. I think it would be dangerous to assume anything at this point. Worst case scenario, I said. How many other coins might he have with him? Michael shrugged. Six, perhaps. But it's just a guess. I stared at him. You're saying that they could have a dozen walking nightmares at this time? He nodded. Last time they came to party, all three swords were here. There were four denarians, and we barely came out of it alive. I know. But you're used to this, right? I asked him. The knights take on odds like this all the time. He gave me an apologetic glance. We like to outnumber them two to one if possible. Three to one when we can arrange it. But Shiro said he had fought several duels against them. I said, one on one. Shiro had a gift, Michael said. It was as simple as that. Shiro knew swordplay like Mozart knew music. I'm not like him. I'm not afraid of facing a single denarian alone, but I would generally consider us evenly matched. My fate would be in God's hands. <laughs> Super, I sighed. Faith, Harry, Michael said. He will not abandon us. There will be a way for good to overcome. Good overcame last time, I said quietly, more or less. But that didn't stop them from killing Shiro. Our lives belong to the Almighty, Michael said evenly. We serve and live for the sake of others, not for our own. Yeah, I said. I'm sure that will comfort your kids when they grow up without a father. Michael abruptly turned to face me squarely, and his right hand closed into a fist. Stop talking, he said in a low, hard tone. Right now. So help me God, I almost took a swing at him out of sheer frustration. But Sanity grabbed the scruff of my neck and turned me around. I stalked several paces away through the snow and stood with my back to him. Sanity invited shame over for tea and biscuits. Damn it. I was supposed to be a wizard, connected with my inner light, master of the disciplined mind, all that kind of crap. But instead, I was shooting my mouth off at a man who didn't deserve it because... Because I was really scared. 
really, really scared. I always started shooting my mouth off when something scared me. It had been an asset before, but it sure as hell wasn't right now. When something scared me, I almost always embraced my anger as a weapon against it. That, too, was usually an asset. But this time, I'd let that fear and anger shape my thinking. And as a result, I'd torn into my friend at the most tender spot he had, at a time when he could probably have used my support. Then I realized why I was angry at Michael. I had wanted him to come flying in like Superman and solve my problems, and he'd let me down. We're always disappointed when we find out someone else has human limits, the same as we do. It's stupid for us to feel that way, and we really ought to know better. But that doesn't seem to slow us down. I wondered if Michael had ever felt the same way about me. My last remark, I muttered, was out of line. Yes, Michael said, it was. You want to duke it out or arm wrestle or something? There are better ways for us to spend our time. Nicodemus and Tessa should be our focus. I turned back to him. Agreed. This isn't over, he said, a harsh edge to his voice. We'll discuss it after. I grunted and nodded. Some of the tension left the air between us. Back to business. That was easier. You know what I don't get? I said. How do you step from Nicodemus' end of recruiting Marcone all the way to Tessa's end of a society steeped in chaos and despair? I don't know, Michael said. He moved his hand to the hilt of his sword he now wore belted to his side, an unconscious gesture. But Nicodemus thinks he does, and whatever he's doing, I've got a bad feeling that we'd better figure it out before he gets it done. Thank you very much for listening to chapter 20 of A Small Favor, book 10 of the Dresden Files. And thank you for coming on this journey with me. Hopefully you guys were able to like, share, and subscribe. And you all have a wonderful and blessed day.